So what are biofuels? Biofuels are things that we can use for energy that are made by biological systems. Most notably, there are two big ones. Ethanol production, which we can get from grains or sugar beets, and biodiesel. Diesel fuel you can get from ordinary oils, vegetable oils, animal oils, things of biological origin. What is ethanol? Ethanol is the good stuff. This is the alcohol you can drink. The things that come out in a, in a whiskey bottle or a beer bottle. Actually, what it is, is the following molecule. We have two carbon groups, and each of them have a hydrogen. Except to make this one an alcohol, there's an oxygen and another hydrogen. This is ethanol. When you go to a gasoline pump, you'll notice it will say, may contain up to 10% alcohol. That is E10. E for ethanol, 10 for 10%. 10 Gasohol is how it used to be named. And now almost all fuel in the United States has this 10% alcohol blend. It becomes an oxygenator, which reduces pollution. It also allows us to substitute some biofuels for the otherwise imported oil that we would have to use. At some gas stations, you will see stuff called E85. It's 85% ethanol. Flex fuel vehicles can easily switch between almost 100% ethanol or 100% gasoline. Both burn very quickly and very well. So the difficulty of using one fuel to another is not that hard. When you go to one of these gas stations, you might notice that the E85 is always cheaper. And you're saying, wow, why don't I use it? Careful. Ethanol only has 70% of the energy content of gasoline. So if you usually get 100 miles per gallon, probably no one gets that, maybe you got a motorcycle. Okay, if you fill it up with 100% ethanol, you'd only get 70 miles per gallon. What you really need to do is look at the price difference and see if it's around that three quarters range, then it's a good deal. So you might wonder, can we grow ourselves out of an energy crisis? Do we not have to import oil or use up the oil from the ground because we can just grow it? Eh, not so fast. Like the world, the U.S. uses an awful lot of gasoline. This chart shows the difference between the amount of gasoline we use, 3.5 billion barrels per year, versus the amount of ethanol. The ethanol is about 10 percent, about 300 million barrels per year. And by the way, a barrel is another one of these strange American units that's equal to 42 gallons. And a gallon is another strange American unit that is actually equal to 3.8 liters. What are you going to do? Let's focus in on just the blue part. So if you look at this chart, you can see that ethanol production in the United States has really ramped up over a period of the last maybe 10 years. But it's reached a plateau. And that plateau is there because we don't have all that much corn. And people still want to eat. Actually, what they want to eat is they want to eat meat. A significant part of our corn crop goes to feeding animals. So here is a graphic that shows the division of the corn that is produced in the United States and where it's used. And you'll notice that the largest single factor is using it for animal feed. But the amount you see there for ethanol is also pretty big. Sometimes you'll have people claim, oh, only a quarter of our corn is used. Another time you'll have a, people say, oh, a third of our corn is used to make fuel. Well, let's look at this a little more closely. See that section there, 13% for feed, co-products, DDG, dried distiller grain. Actually, they take a whole third of our corn, but after you make the alcohol out of it, the stuff that's left 
can be dried and once again fed to the animals. So it depends if you want to count that as a third of the corn for fuel or only two-thirds of it and the rest goes to animal feed. Notice that there's also a significant export portion. While maybe we could increase that amount of ethanol we make, you can notice that there's got to be some limit. When you start trading food security for energy security, you can end up having some problems. Since you can substitute corn to make alcohol for oil, but we also use corn for the feedstocks, which are going to go into our meat products and our milk and so forth, you might wonder, is there a correlation in price? This chart shows that indeed there is. Notice that when oil prices go up, corn prices go up, and therefore food prices go up. Maybe it's not a perfect correlation, but there are several locations along this graph where you can see clearly that trend. So probably having corn make 10% of our gasoline, since we use it in a 10% mixture, is probably just right, the right amount, about as much as you're going to be able to get out of this biofuel crop at least in the United States. You might say, well, that's good, so it replaces 10% of our oil. Well, not so fast. This particular graph shows the distribution of how oil is used and where oil is used to make our different fuels. There are as many cars as people in the United States. We're pretty darn close. So automobile fuel, gasoline, uses about half of the oil. That's only half. So really when people say, oh, corn uses 10% of the gasoline, it's substituting for about 5% of the oil. Many of these figures you're seeing are from the 2011-2012. But as you noticed with the graph on how much ethanol we're making, these numbers are very flat and continue to this level about to today. So let's take another look at that division of how the oil that comes in, the crude oil that comes in to the country is then used. You can see that the next largest use after gasoline is diesel fuel. Diesel fuel is what runs the trucks. So can you actually substitute biomass, plants, for diesel fuel? Well, indeed you can, and it's called biodiesel. Soybeans are like a whole food. You can use it, you can live off of it. You can't live off of corn alone. So soybeans are very valuable. They cost more to make, they cost more to buy, and they have more food value. But still, if you have excess, economics can tell you whether or not it makes sense to turn it into diesel fuel. So looking at this biofuel trends, you can see that we use much less uh, biodiesel than we do ethanol. It turns out that about, of all the diesel fuel we use, 4% of it is from biodiesel. So that means since diesel fuel is 20% of our oil use, our crude oil use, it's 0.8% of our crude oil is substituted by soybeans. So if we're using 4% of our diesel fuels from soybeans, the question is, well, how many soybeans is that? Well here, just like with the corn, the answer is a little more complicated. First off, all soybeans aren't used for oil. This chart shows you how much goes into the crush, how much of the soybeans are actually turned into oil. You can see it's about half, maybe a little more than half. So about half of the soybeans are turned into soybean oil. But of course, not all of the soybean oil is turned into biodiesel. This chart shows you that it's about one-fifth of the soybean oil that goes into biodiesel. So if we had half of the soybeans make oil, one-fifth of the oil makes diesel fuel, one-fifth times one-half, that's 10%. 10% of our soybeans are turned into biodiesel fuel. The cool thing is that you don't need soybean oil to make biodiesel. In fact, you can make it about out of any biological oil itself. You can use it out of the grease, you can make it out of chicken fat, you can go to McDonald's, to the fry pans where they make the french fries, and when they're done with it, you can turn that into biodiesel. 
There's even how-to instructional videos on the web that will tell you how you can make your own biodiesel generating system. In fact, it's really not all that hard. Let me show you how it's done. So, how do you take the things growing in those beautiful green lush fields, soybeans after they dry, and take them out of the husks until you get the, the, the beans themselves and turn that in to diesel fuel. That's what I'm gonna show you right now. The first step is that you don't actually use the soy beans. You need to take the beans, and actually, you won't do this part at home. You need to crush them, which is even harder than corn, and turn it into soybean oil. 100% pure, good soybean oil. Of course, the soybean oil costs more than just going out and buying diesel fuel. So the real use of this is if you get some waste oil. You get the oil from your fryer. You go to your local chicken place and get their oil. Of course, if you do that, you better clean it. You gotta strain it. You gotta get all those strange bits of things that are left in the fryer out. But finally, you're gonna end up with oil. Soybeans crushed makes oil. First step in making biodiesel is you need to heat up the oil. And you need to worry about the temperature. So unlike making alcohol from corn where you just need to keep the water liquid stuff going between 70, 80, and 100 C, here we need to heat this up to a particular level to get the reaction to take place. So I'm going to start with 800 milliliters of soybean oil. So we need to heat the oil up to 54 degrees centigrade, 130 Fahrenheit. Not too far away. Right now we're at about 40. Just be a few more minutes. Depending on the pH of your oil, you need to add some lye some potassium hydroxide. It turns out for, for regular oil, you only need 6.4 grams for 800 milliliters. So here is my potassium hydroxide. And this stuff I really do have to crush. All right. If the pH of your oil is a little different, you can look up on a, in a biodiesel calculator how much lye you need to add to it. So now we add just this right amount of lye to the cooking oil. And we need to stir it. This will adjust its uh, pH, its acid level, to just the right amount. Now, we need the other ingredient, methyl alcohol. Not the kind of alcohol we were uh, making when we did corn, that's ethyl alcohol. This is not the stuff that you can drink. This is the stuff that actually would make you go blind if you drank it. We're not distilling liquor here. We're making fuel for buses and trucks, tractors. For the 800 milliliters of oil, we need 175 milliliters of methanol. There we go. Now this is relatively simple chemistry. And we get a reaction that will actually take oil and methanol and turn it into two products. The first is the one we want, the diesel fuel, alkanes and cyclic hydrocarbons. The other product will be glycerin. Glycerin is fairly thick, all right? And the glycerin will actually have methanol still stuck with it. If you're doing this on industrial scales, you can actually reclaim most of this methanol and use it over again. So here is the reaction. So you have to add this slowly. 
We add this a little bit at a time, and you can see how it's bubbling up. That's why I'm doing this outside, or you do it in a well-ventilated area. The chemical reaction is slightly exothermic, and it's actually taking place. It's also important not to have the temperature of your oil too high, because if it's too high, the methanol is simply just going to boil. I can actually tell that some of the process is happening because the oil is getting thicker. So just in case we're at too high a temperature, I've already turned off the hot plate, but let me just move it over here. Just check my temperature again. Methanol was, of course, much cooler, so I'm going to need to add a little bit of heat here. Well, it wasn't that exciting. Now comes the boring part. We wait. We actually use gravity. The diesel fuel will be lighter than the glycerin, and it needs to sit here and separate. Well, you know, sometimes it can just take a long time to separate. However, if you look here closely, you can start seeing it being much clearer and lighter at the very top. In time, this layer will continue, and the glycerin will be on the bottom with the excess alcohol, and the diesel fuel on the top. A proper setup for this would have a drain from the bottom of the tank, and you would drain out the glycerin and the methanol. At that point, you would boil it, well, you would heat it up to turn the methanol into a vapor and recover it from the glycerin. The glycerin you can throw away, maybe there's a market for it. The stuff left in your tank is the diesel fuel you can put in your tractor, truck, or car. While it sounds very romantic that we can take all of this deep fryer oil and turn it into biodiesel, we use so much more fuel than we do french fries. Only this tiny little green bar on the graph is the amount of biodiesel made from waste oil. So chemically, what is gasoline? You might not realize it, but you're told every time you're at a gasoline pump because there's an octane rating. An octane, like octopus, means eight. There are eight carbons in gasoline, in octane. Gasoline is basically octane. The octane molecule has eight carbon in a chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And each of these would have a hydrogen stuck onto it. So the chemical formula is C8H18. Sometimes the octane is branched, sometimes it's not in this perfect long line, but basically this is what gasoline is. Gasoline is dangerous. Gasoline is extremely volatile. You can burn things very easily, like this. Here is gasoline. Here is diesel fuel. Huh. Diesel fuel is not even lighting. In fact, that exactly shows the point. The only reason the stick's burning is because I put gasoline on the stick. Finally, I might get the straw hat to burn, but it shows a pretty dramatic difference between why diesel fuels, relatively safe stuff, gasoline, it's a bomb. When you distill crude oil, you refine it. And in that process, you can get the lighter hydrocarbons off, the gaseous ones, then the gasoline. And the next thing to come off is the diesel fuel. Diesel is a little heavier than octane. In fact, about three quarters of diesel fuel are the slightly heavier alkanes. Maybe instead of eight carbons, you've got 10 or 12 plus that many hydrogens. That would be 22 or 26. That molecule, naphthalene, is another part 
of what's in diesel fuel itself. So 75% of diesel fuel are these just longer chains like gasoline, things with 10 carbons, 12 carbons, up in that range. The other quarter are cyclic hydrocarbons, places where the carbon atoms go in a ring. Most common one of these, where there are simply six carbons in a ring with alternating single and double bonds, and hydrogens coming out of each of these is benzene. It's pretty lightweight, probably not too much of that in diesel fuel. But if we add another methyl group here for toluene or a second one maybe down here for xylene, these indeed are parts and components of diesel fuel. Likewise, if you have two carbon rings that are joined, all right, like tiling hexagons, all right, this is naphthalene, one of the cyclic hydrocarbons in diesel fuel. And that's what you need to know.